Stop what you're doing, actually wait. <laughs> What you're doing is watching this video, keep doing that. But it has been brought to my attention that the bunny behind me has no name and needs a name. So I pass that responsibility on to you. What should the bunny's name be? Don't mess this up. This is a new show. Sup, you beautiful bastards. Welcome back to the Philip DeFranco Show. I got a fantastic Wednesday show for you today, but first, a friendly reminder to grab what you want while you can over at beautifulbastard.com. We just had the June drop. Grab yourself one or some of the, oh my God, so comfortable, emotionally exhausted tie-dyes, and or one of the, are you taking care of yourself tie-dyes, and or one of the beautiful bastard embrace changes line. All available at that top link down below or beautifulbastard.com. But with that said, buckle up, hit that like button, and let's just jump into it. Yo, first up today, let's do some rapid fire Fire news based off of your recommendations. Every day on the text line, people are asking me to talk about this story or that story. A lot of them really don't have a lot of depth, but I figured, hey, let's tie them all together. Starting with Jeffree Star said he keeps around 100 guns and is, quote, waiting for someone to trespass on his property. Well, one, he wouldn't be the first YouTuber to say something like that. And two, y'all, let's be honest, if Jeffree Star is really just waiting to be able to legally kill someone, that's kind of a win. Because I don't know about you, but I see Jeffree posting this picture and I'm like, oh, he definitely flies people out to a private island and then hunts them. Just to feel something. Like, both the people in that picture look like they have lobbied Congress to legalize the purge. Then, according to the Post, Jennifer Aniston trolled his nepotism baby for calling out stars famous for nothing, with her at one point during a Variety interview saying the thing of people becoming famous for basically doing nothing. I mean, Paris Hilton, Monica Lewinsky, all those. And here's what I'll say, I think there are plenty of examples of people pretty much being famous for nothing. Though, I think if you're able to stay famous and get people to still care about you for some reason, despite there being no reason to, I think that is a skill in itself. Though, I, I do personally take issue with her, including Monica Lewinsky, because she was, like, she wasn't trying to be famous. Right, she has remained famous today because she's actually a good writer, but I mean, back then, do you remember? Somehow you had a situation where the President of the United States, Bill Clinton, cheated on his wife with an employee while, I mean, you want to talk about power dynamics, while not only being her boss, but being the most powerful person in the world, and still a ton of people made her out to be the primary villain. She, without a desire to, became famous, a punchline. Meanwhile, the guy that cheated on her had the people around him throwing her under the bus. Oh, and as far as nepotism in Hollywood, yeah, there's a lot of it. Do pretty much any research on almost any of the stars that you like, and you'll find out that a majority of them have like rich ass parents or parents with connections. Sure, you can say money doesn't buy happiness, but it sure as fuck buys opportunities and safety net after safety net after safety net. And then more specifically, when it comes to the world of acting, uh, when I've talked to actor and actress friends that are in the industry, it does seem like having a following online is now becoming a massive or has become a massive part of it. And for me, this random story kind of brings me to the question of, will we have massive stars like we used to have? Or there's been more and more of a conversation where there being so much content out there, you're not gonna have like the next Tom Cruise, the next Will Smith. But I don't know how true that is or if it's universal because I just saw that like one of the guys from BTS had a live stream that had over 6 million people watching and he was washing dishes. Though that's more of an example of mainstream famous using the internet rather than internet famous jumping into the mainstream. I don't know. This is what happens when you give me stories and I have no set goal at the beginning of it. And then we got to talk about the fact that if the FDA had not dragged their feet on their latest approval, which just happened this week, Will Smith would still be able to go to the Oscars. So you know how we all learned way more information about alopecia than we ever expected to learn because Will Smith slapped Chris Rock for what he said about his wife, resulting in everyone going, what the fuck, was that real? And then a few minutes later, people Googling it and going, oh, okay, so it's an autoimmune disease where the immune system attacks hair follicles, often causing them to fall out and leaving sufferers to large bald spots or being entirely bald. And actually, it can be more than just a cosmetic problem, right? The, the hair on your scalp, it helps block the sun. Uh, other hair follicles, such as eyelashes, nose hairs, and hairs in your ears of major functions. Allergies, which already suck, can be far worse for those people. Hearing can be affected. And there hasn't really been an effect effective treatment for it with topical creams being mostly experimental and with unclear results. But doctors had found that a family of arthritis medications known as JAK inhibitors had promising results on mice. So some began to prescribe them off-label to alopecia patients and they got surprising results, leading Eli Lilly, a drug manufacturer, to sponsor different blind studies involving 1,200 people with severe alopecia for their JAK inhibitor, finding that nearly 40% of those who took the drug had complete or near complete hair regrowth after 36 weeks, with almost half of the patients having their hair back after 52 weeks. And the side effects were relatively mild with things like slight respiratory infection, Infections, urinary tract infections or acne. So with how great these results were, you have people going, well, why does it even need to be approved if doctors are already giving out the drugs off label? Well, like most things in the American medical system, it comes down to insurance. It was extremely difficult for doctors and patients to convince the insurance companies to cover these drugs, which would cost upwards of $2,500 for uses that they weren't approved for. While Eli Lilly has now been approved for one treatment using their JAK inhibitor, both Pfizer and Concert Pharmaceuticals are on the verge of also being approved for their versions, which is a potential positive because patients who may not respond well to one drug in this family may respond better to another. So fantastic and life-changing news for the nearly 300,000 Americans who suffer from severe alopecia. But unfortunately still, it was too late to protect Chris Rock. And then are you looking to
to book a summer getaway, but you don't want to break the bank? Well, today's fantastic sponsor, Hopper, has you covered. You know, I've been using the Hopper app to find and secure the best deals on flights, hotels, and car rentals for a while now. And I have to say, recently, I've been loving their monthly travel sales, which provide additional savings on top of Hopper's already low prices. And Hopper's largest sale yet is on now until June 17th, where you can get up to $180 off trips to 50 top destinations like Vegas, Miami, LA, Paris, Rome, and more. If your travel dates are flexible, use Hopper's color-coded deals calendar to find the cheapest travel date for your trip. Or if you're not looking to book right away, just watch a trip, and Hopper will monitor prices for you 24-7 and notify you when it's the right time to buy. Plus, earn cash back for every booking you make on Hopper and automatically apply your rewards towards any future trips. And new users that download Hopper for free with my link will automatically earn a $30 welcome bonus to apply towards your first bookings on the app. So remember, Hopper Summer Sale is only on for a limited time, so download the app today to ensure that you don't miss out on these exclusive offers. And then, you know, yesterday I told y'all we weren't going to get a January 6th hearing today, possibly because the Supreme Court was going to throw down a decision on Roe v. Wade. And obviously you can't split airtime between the attempted takedown of democracy in the U.S. with the fall of women's rights. But what actually happened is the Supreme Court did not post their decision today, but the January 6th committee did release some more information. Right? We knew that the committee has been looking into what has been described as alleged surveillance tours given by some junior Republican lawmakers just ahead of the insurrection. And in particular here, they had asked Representative Barry Loudermilk to talk about a tour that he gave on January 5th, suggesting that the committee had information that the tour wasn't what it seemed. Now, Loudermilk denied that and at the time said, a constituent family with young children meeting with their member of Congress in the House office buildings is not a suspicious group or reconnaissance tour. The family never entered the Capitol building. Now, it turned out that the tour ended up being around 15 people, not just a small family, but Capitol Police still said in a recent letter that they had looked at the footage of the Louder Milk tour and found nothing suspicious, with Republicans touting this as a victory, saying the Democrats were just trying to make something out of nothing. But today, the committee released the footage they have, and it showed Louder Milk giving a tour of the Capitol complex to a group that had at least one person who was later alleged to have filmed threats against lawmakers on January 6th on the way to the Capitol. We're coming in like white on rice for Pelosi, Nadler, Schumer, even you, AOC. We're coming to take you out. We'll pull you out by your hairs. Now. With this, it is possible that Loudermilk had no idea that the man was dangerous or would make threats against lawmakers, but the footage of the tour shows people in that group acting, uh, some would say, odd. And or, as the committee put it, certain tour group members, such as the man who had made threats, were cataloging parts of the complex that are, quote, not typically of interest to tourists, including hallways, staircases, and security checkpoints. Now with this, Loudermilk himself has responded to requests that he speak more about the tour, saying, the false narrative that the committee and Democrats continue to push that Republicans, including myself, led reconnaissance tours is verifiably false, with them also highlighting that no one in the tour that he led was criminally charged in relation to January 6th. But you have others saying, regardless, this shows that at the very least, people in the tour were obviously acting suspicious and nothing was done about it. But for now, we're gonna have to wait to see if the committee has anything else to attach to this, what else comes out, and of course, that starts back up again tomorrow. And then, after yesterday's elections in five states, we are now basically halfway through the primary season. And overall, yesterday was a very good day for Republicans and indicates that the party is on a solid path to make gains in November. With that being especially true in Texas, where we saw Republican Mayor of Flores when a special election in the Rio Grande Valley to fill a seat vacated by a Democrat. According to reports, Flores will now be the first Republican to represent the district and the first Latina Republican from Texas in Congress, with the GOP hailing her win as an indicator that their efforts to win over Hispanic voters is working. But some say while these inroads are notable, Flores' victory specifically may be short-lived, noting that this was just a special election, so Flores still has to participate in the November election where her district has been redrawn to heavily favored Democrats. But Texas wasn't the only place that we saw important Republican wins, and especially wins among Trump-backed candidates and those who have embraced the big lie. In fact, according to 538, only three Republicans who have said that the 2020 election was legitimate won their races yesterday. And only one of those three, Representative Nancy Mays of South Carolina, won in a contest that was along pro-Trump, anti-Trump lines. And very notably here, another anti-Trump Republican in the state that voted to impeach Trump ended up losing his race to a Trump-endorsed challenger. But the place that we saw the most significant inroads among election-denying candidates yesterday was Nevada, which is arguably one of the most important things because it is set to be one of the most competitive battleground states with some of the most consequential races that could determine the balance of power in the House and Senate this fall. Right, for example, in a key Senate race that is very much up for grabs, Republicans nominated former Attorney General Adam Laxalt, who was once a leader of Trump's efforts to overturn the election in Nevada and has been endorsed by the former president. Meanwhile, at the state level, Jim Marchin, who organized a network of 2020 election deniers, won the Republican primary for Nevada Secretary of State, which is especially alarming because a victory for him in November would give a big lie promoter serious power over election administration as the state's top election official. But Nevada is by no means the only place where this is a threat. According to reports, as we near 
near the halfway point of this cycle's primaries, the potential for far-right Republicans to reshape the election systems of major battleground states is growing much closer to reality, with Republican voters so far nominating dozens of candidates for offices with power over the administration and certification of elections who have spread falsehoods about the 2020 presidential election and so distrust in American democracy. And what's even more concerning is this is far from over. We're only halfway through, and according to a new analysis from the Washington Post, more than 100 GOP candidates who back the big lie won their elections just by the end of May when only a third of the primaries were complete. And while yes, Trump-backed candidates saw embarrassing losses in Georgia, they have been regaining some ground in primaries since. In fact, according to an Axios tracker updated to include yesterday's races, only nine of his candidates in competitive races have lost so far, while 26 have won. Though, the outlet did point out that while his record is still positive overall, it is far weaker when candidates running unopposed or in non-competitive races are filtered out. But still, Axios noting that another 20 competitive races are still in progress. With the upcoming primaries in Colorado, Arizona, and Wisconsin getting flagged as opportunities for Republicans to demonstrate how willing they are to support big lie candidates. And so with this, what I'll say, and it's especially to the Democratic groups yesterday that we talked about that are trying to promote far, far right people because they think it gives them a better matchup. You know how a lot of people voted for Biden even though they didn't really support Biden and it was more that they didn't like the other guy? The same can and will be said in the 2022 midterms. What we're talking about is an ongoing existential threat to the very core of democracy and not nearly enough people are taking it that seriously. And then in international news, we should definitely talk about the effort to deport illegal migrants over in the UK and that because it is splitting the country right now and we've got some dramatic news on it. Right, so back in April, the conservative government announced a policy to deport some asylum seekers who enter the country illegally. Legally, redirecting them 4,000 miles away to Rwanda instead, where they can seek permanent refugee status, apply to settle there on other grounds, or seek asylum in a third country. But this meant to deter migrants from arriving through what the UK government calls illegal, dangerous, or unnecessary methods like smuggling themselves in small boats or trucks. For some background here, migrants have made that journey from northern France across the English Channel for a long time now, and over 28,000 entered the UK in boats last year, up from 8,500 the year before that, with notably dozens of people dying on the way, like the 27 who drowned in a single incident when a boat capsized last November. And under the government's plan, and they've got some accommodations waiting for them in Rwanda, which you can see in this video from Hope Hostel in the capital. So naturally with this, you had charities, lawyers, and other rights groups opposing the plan in courts, questioning whether Rwanda is a safe destination for these refugees, with the likes of the UN Refugee Agency condemning this as unworkable and discriminatory, accusing the UK of shifting its burden to a developing country and shirking its responsibility to take in refugees. Which all leads us to yesterday's news, because the first flight of refugees to Rwanda was set to depart in the evening. You had 37 people originally supposed to be on board, but due to legal challenges, that number dwindled down to just about seven, with one of them telling the Guardian he is in a very bad mental state and doesn't want to go to Rwanda, a country which he knows nothing about. And last-ditch efforts to stop the flight altogether failed, with the Court of Appeals rejecting them on Monday and the Supreme Court upholding the policy on Tuesday. But then, just an hour and a half before the plane was about to take off, the European Court of Human Rights barges in the door and goes, wait, 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 stopping the flight after ruling that one of the seven asylum seekers, a 54-year-old Iraqi man, he can't be deported until three weeks after the delivery of the final domestic decision in his ongoing judicial review proceedings, which, through all seven cases back into the courts, at least until a high court ruling on the policy next month. So now you have UK Home Secretary Priti Patel saying preparations for the next flight will begin now and defending the policy in front of lawmakers. We cannot keep on spending nearly £5 million a day on accommodation, including that of hotels. We cannot accept this intolerable pressure on public services and right. local communities. It makes us less safe as a nation because those who come here illegally do not have the regularised checks or even the regularised status. Yes and because evil people smuggling gangs use the proceeds of their ill-gotten gains to fund other appalling crimes that undermine the security of our country. You also have the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, Filippo Grandi, expressing bewilderment at the government's plan yesterday. We believe that this is all wrong. This is all wrong. I mean, saving people from dangerous journeys is great, is absolutely great. But is that the right way to do it? Is that the right, is that the real motivation for this uh, deal to happen? I don't think so. I think it's, 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 I don't know what it is. And even some refugees have been speaking out like this Iranian in a British detention center who arrived by boat being told to prepare for deportation then given a late reprieve. Did you ever think that they would send you to Africa? I thought in the UK there were human rights, he says. But so far, I haven't seen any evidence. And so for now, we're in this situation where it looks like it's going to be drug out for a while in the judicial system and probably turn into even more of a mess. But with this recent news and the asylum plan in general, I'd love to know your thoughts. Of course, that goes to everyone, but especially if you're in the UK. And ultimately, that is where that story and today's show ends. My name is Philip DeFranco. You've just been filled in. I love yo faces and I'll see you tomorrow.